in tribal communities in general, uh, they tend to be um, small communities, they tend to be tight-knit communities. Uh, it's possible that if you're an advocate who is not from a tribal community that you may not have as much experience with what are the, um, so some of the assumed cultural um, issues for people, what are the um, natural ways of sharing information or of not sharing information, what kind of sharing feels shameful, um, what kind of sharing feels totally reasonable. Uh, and so it's, uh, um, that's just on top of the issues of what does it feel like to lose control over your information, to have a report made um, that is about you and you didn't necessarily want it to happen, and what might be the community blowback to the survivor for having outed someone if they um, have status in the tribe or status in the community that is threatened by disclosing abuse. When you think about victims who are living in a tribal community, are there unique barriers that they face to getting help, getting services? We have a lot of challenges in our tribal communities, and one of them is that many of the tribes have not developed the infrastructure um, to create a response. So it opens up um, a challenge around uh, reaching out into non-native systems surrounding um, the tribal lands, and in that, um, there's jurisdictional challenges and sovereignty challenges. I think when we talk about sovereignty, we have to look at the nation-to-nation -nation relationship that tribes hold with the federal government. Um, so as a result of both um, the federal government being a sovereign nation and the tribes being a sovereign nation, they have a relationship together um, that um, that the two uh, nations interact with. And as a tribe, as a sovereign nation, that um, each tribe has the right to, um, to exert its own authority, its sovereign authority, as well as to self-determine, to shape and define its own programs, its own resources, um, without outside influence. Vicki, does jurisdiction complicate the response to elder abuse in tribal communities? It actually can. Um, so jurisdiction, when we look at um, tribal communities, we're, we're having to respect the fact that tribes are sovereign nations, and so they have jurisdictional authority on tribal land. But depending on the type of abuse, whether it's a major crime, then that falls under federal jurisdiction. And then we also, depending on where the tribe is located, um, what state and what authority has been transferred from the federal government, we could have state authority coming into play. And so the tribe always retains um, its sovereign authority, its concurrent jurisdiction. And when we look at the responses and if the tribe does not have the capacity to respond, then we have to look at who is going to respond and whether the tribe wants to involve the state authority as well as how that works in terms of the federal authority being involved. One of the biggest challenges that we have is that many tribes do not have an adult protective service program. So it opens up a big challenge around whether or not the tribe will work with or wants to work with adult protective services um, from the state. And the, one of the difficulties is, is that on tribal lands, um, some tribes being public law 280, um, adult protective services would have authority to come in, whereas other tribes would not, which opens up a whole big can of worms around jurisdiction. I think one of the critical pieces is for tribal leadership to really think about and explore what they want to do about adult protective services, whether they want to create it within their tribe or build a partnership with adult protective services and work to ensure that adult protective services is educated on how to work with an, a native elder population.